Welcome to GuestCast. Tune in and listen as we speak to global education experts about the latest trends, challenges and stories that matter. Hello and welcome to the GuestCast. Today we're joined by Phil Alcock, founder of ALX PBL, the AI Enhanced Project Based Learning. Phil's got some exciting projects in development that we're going to dive into today. So, Phil, could you tell our audience a little bit more about you and how you first became interested in AI? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so, yeah, about me, I guess I'm ultimately an innovative educator, I guess the word would be. I wear many hats, so it's always a hard question to answer. I've been an educator for over 10 years, but I've also been like very interested in learning, education, systems, lots of different things in jobs, in technology and higher education and business and things like that. So I got into education. I went over to Vietnam and started teaching and just found it was such an interesting world just to be innovative, to to just have fun with teaching and then have that feeling of, you know, people being taught. Um, I went and studied to be a like a homeroom teacher in Australia. And then I learned all these great things in university. I loved it, got into game-based learning and project-based learning and thought, um, you know, this education and, and, and the world is like pretty exciting to what can happen. And then I went to the schools and realized, wow, this is completely different, what's going on? Um, a lot of teachers running around giving worksheets to kids, a lot of problems in schools and things like that. So I guess I sort of took that on from a really early time and thought, you know what, I'm going to try and do this um, project learning and innovative learning and, and try and make learning a little bit more interesting. When I was a sustainability teacher in Melbourne, I wanted a way to connect with all the students and I only had them once per week. So that's where I started getting into project based learning and problem based learning. And I started to just work it out and, and read about it and learn about it and listen to podcasts and all those kind of things. And then over time, I just started to just really develop my project based learning. I read a lot more. I, I got into the PBL works gold standard and things like that. Um, and then I started to be a teacher. I did a few different roles as specialist roles. I went over to Mexico to a project based learning school and got in there. The, the school was like it was it was advertised as like a project based learning school, but it definitely wasn't. You know, there was definitely they did one project a term and they didn't do them very well. They just kind of followed a basic structure, but it wasn't really involved and it was messy. And, you know, it's, a, I guess, the start of project based learning. But I started to realize that, you know, my skills are pretty good. Maybe I can teach people. Maybe I can find that, you know, let's find ways that we can teach teachers how we can learn about project based learning. And so over time, I just found that like the kids were engaged, things were interesting. I thought this is like a, a really great change of education. And then AI came along and it was like, wow, now all that extra time where I have to connect curriculums and personal interests and all those things that I've wanted to do and never had the time to do, now I can do it. So I had that decision. I thought, well, can I do another year and really get into project based learning and AI or should I take a year off and just kind of learn about this AI stuff and try and teach other people around the world? So I just jumped onto LinkedIn. I met John Kelly from Caligio Ikigai in Mexico City. I talked about a few ideas. We came up with the name AIX PBL and then we just started getting into the idea of having a whole school approach to project based learning. And then over time, I just kept learning about it, sharing my things on LinkedIn. And here I am really, like I'm very busy. I work with a lot of different schools and educators around the world. But I, I find that my passion and the reason why I'm sort of explaining the whole thing is my passion's taken a long time to develop. And for project based learning, there is a lot of parts to it and there's a lot of things to learn. And you start off and you don't really know what you're doing and the kids are in groups and some people are working and some people aren't and things like that. But with AI now, you can really simplify projects. You can really connect with the curriculum. You can make a project about a, you know, geography project about a motorbike journey, you know, and you can actually connect it in with student interest. So now my kind of aim is to 
I guess not only just do project-based learning, but to really think about AI literacy and what projects can do for AI literacy and for the world of AI. Oh, oh we've yeah. covered a lot of ground, yeah. You've worked yeah. on so many interesting Sorry, things that was already. A long answer. No, no, that's all good. <laughs> actually made me think of some other new questions aside from what I've got written down. For what sure. are the key differences you found with teaching in Australia compared to Mexico? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really get to see the full picture. I was in like a, a you know, a privileged school, really. Um, it was an international school. The pe that most of the kids that, that went there were very, very privileged, you know, compared to the rest of Mexico. So it was a little bit different. Um, I guess like ultimately it's the same thing. Schools are all the same. We're all trying to teach kids how to write and read and, and how to do maths and, you know, how to treat each other well and how to solve problems and those kind of things. But Mexico is incredibly different. The teachers, the way that the public perceives teachers just in like the social um, structure and things like that, their pay is really low. International teachers, it's low, but like general teachers in Mexico is extremely low. And, you know, and, and that's the difference that I see. It's just the motivation that I might have as a teacher. I've, I'm sort of privileged in a way because I get paid enough that I don't have to do another job and I can learn all these extra cool things. Whereas a lot of teachers in Mexico have to do multiple jobs to, to keep going. So same with America as well, really. Um, wow. You know, and so they don't have the time to do all that extra study and extra things to we might be privileged to do in in you know our jobs even though we're busy we can still do it whereas that's the biggest difference i see like these guys can get paid really really low they can teach at schools without even you know any uh you know there's a teacher that had to bring a cd player and bring it out to a, an area that was a little bit risky and it was like just bringing that cd player for the kids to listen to a song and dance to it at school is actually a risky thing that that person can get robbed for their CD player and it might not be a good idea. So, I mean, the differences are exponentially different with, we complain about things, about challenges we have, and you know, they're very valid with parents and things like that, but what Mexican teachers go through is, yeah, amazing. They get sent to areas, there's a lot of females, they travel by themselves to these areas. They have to go, on roads they don't most people don't have cars they can't afford cars so you imagine they've got to catch buses and and take these little shared combi vans and things like that so definitely the safety and those kind of things are hugely different um mm. and that's not even to mention the pay the benefits you know and the challenges of the job so yeah that's like the biggest thing that i see the international schools are a little bit different they're a little bit luckier the pe teachers that work there get paid a lot more than even probably even get paid more than doctors in 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 some ways but because they know English and they know the other systems but most other teachers don't have that privilege yeah yeah it sounds yeah. like it's just on a whole different scale really yeah yeah well going back to some of the projects you're working on because I know I know you're working on a lot um can you tell us a bit more about your project with iCamp sure um, so yeah, the project with iCamp is working on two different um, things that I'm working on. One of them is like a curriculum design, which is like instructional design. I'm kind of bringing a bit of that project-based learning approach, um, looking at ways to connect, you know, to have good quality learning in STEM centers, um, but also have it to be engaging, you know, that they're, say they're learning coding or they're learning about hydraulic that it's actually really valid good learning but it's fun so it's like that mix of like a fun project with some really good learning so i'm sort of working on that helping them redesign their um systems with summer camps and also after school which is really fun um, i'm also helping them with a ai development project and that's going really really well that's um what's it called school ed.ai and I really like that project is really like, it, it's so interesting because it's like that next stage of, you know, teachers going on to chat GPT, for example, they say, write me a lesson plan or whatever they do. And often it doesn't come up with that good outputs, you know, you have to rework them or change them and do a lot of work. 
So we're kind of developing that next level that it's a bit higher, you know, it's getting trained, it's getting fine tuned on good outputs. And then you can work out, well, what are the things that teachers are going to need? What does it look like? What's going to be effective? How can they, you know, do a range of things to help support them in their job? So I've kind of taken on that hat as well. Um, but really what I like about iCamp so much is I think that, you know, any kind of like um, summer camp or STEM or those kind of things, this world of AI is just really starting to transform that world. And, you know, they're kind of in the front center of all of it, really. And the kids are going to benefit the most. So it's really cool just to work with a bunch of really passionate educators in America um, and have a lot of effect. There's over 100 schools and, you know, many, many students that we're affecting. But it's that kind of thing to kind of go, it's weird when you think about it that you're making learning fun for a summer camp, but then you think, well, why can't we make learning like that fun in schools? You know, it's the same yeah. kind of thing. It's like we get really serious. We have to cover all these things. And it's almost like summer camp is like, fun, let's do this. Let's have a project about this. Let's do all that. And then schools are kind of like, all right, well, now we've got to get serious. And it's like, why are we changing our way? So that's what's so the most interesting thing to work on with iCamp is they're just so innovative and, you know, and kids love it. You know, they, they it's really great to see how many kids love just making robots and even like females in STEM and those kind of things that we're, we're facing some of those challenges, but also giving them great after school learning experiences, you know, which I would have loved with, if I was a kid for sure. Yeah, now it's great to bring that enjoyment to the whole school year, like you say, not just summer camp, because, well, the school t school terms are a lot longer and you might as well enjoy what you're learning because you're more likely to retain it as well. Exactly, and yeah. And the more you start to just kind of figure out these things with AI as well, you kind of go, well, we are teaching the concepts of coding, but we're teaching it by writing a story or we're teaching it by doing something different and abstract. And you kind of see some of these abstract approaches can work really well. This next question might be a bit hard to answer, but do you have a favorite project that you've worked on to date? Sure. Um, so yeah, I had multiple favorite projects that I could probably talk about all of them, why they're mm -hmm. my favorite. Um, but I think the one that really stands out is um, the Edgy Metaverse project that I'm working on with Andrew Wright. And from so many levels, I feel like this world is something that it's great that we connected through Collegio Ikigai through um, John Kelly, and he uses Edgy Metaverse. He was telling me about how cool this is, and look, you don't even need VR goggles. The kids can just use a, a like a computer, and they can visit these virtual worlds. And I thought, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. And I had a look at them and thought, wow, that's interesting. There's worlds in Mars. There's worlds in you know all these different areas underwater and everything. And I started working with Andrew, and now we're kind of creating these project um project based learning units but using ai in multiple ways so we're using it to connect with curriculum so if there's a curriculum one that we're doing at the moment is about civics it's for a, a school in the uk actually and it's about vikings and so where you know there's a viking world and you have to the project is to explore this world to learn about you know, the Viking, the different, the kings and the people in society, um, you interact with them in different ways. There's videos, there's documents. So there's like this multimodal immersive experience and we're creating these packs with AI, but not only that, we can kind of look at what the assets might be. So you could get an artifact. You can now generate that artifact in AI. You can, you know, use a generative AI you might have an artifact of a, you know, like a, an axe, a Viking axe or something. And then you can recreate that in the metaverse that kids can essentially look at all around the size of it and things like that with um, virtual reality. If you think of even like castles and things like that, going back to medieval times, you can then go in, look in the VR, go and see what they look like in kind of real life and, and get that view with the VR goggles. You don't even need the VR goggles. You can still access it in like a kind of Minecraft kind of environment, I guess you'd call it like that, where you walk around and look around and look up and look down and have your different views. 
I find that the reason why that's so interesting is because now you can have AI interactions. So you can essentially have chatbots as non-playable characters that you walk up and chat with to try and find out information. So it's kind of like that game immersive experience with projects that, you know, it's more than project-based learning. You're kind of like reliving these experiences. You know, you go to a, a market in medieval market, you can learn about all the things that they're doing and you could essentially do a math activity. Well, these are the things they have in the market. How do we share it with the people and things like that? So you're creating that like real world experiences, but they're kind of immersive and they're also historical. So it sort of teaches you, well, why did the people want this? Why did they do this? Why did they do that? And so these worlds can also open up levels of inquiry that then you imagine a class might be really interested in Viking boats or something. And then essentially then that teacher could go back to Edgy Metaverse and say, the kids love Viking boats. We really want to do that for next term. And then bang, we can create a world around Viking boats. We can connect in whatever their curriculum requirements might be for the term and then create this like immersive experience. So I feel like all learning is eventually is going to go within the metaverse and within those kind of worlds. And the more that we can develop that, especially using AI, now that we can create assets, we can create worlds. If you want to create a world for kindergarten students about bubble gum all around you and, you know, all these cool things, then you can create that. And then they can experience it. They can build things in Minecraft and put that into the metaverse. So you, it's like it's it's a showcase of their learning. They can put up their learning, but they can also be immersive and inquire within that experience. And I don't think there's anything in traditional education that would come close to that experience. And it's accessible for all students. You know, not all students are going to learn best by sitting there listening to the teacher and and doing their work. So in that world. Obviously, it's exciting for the kids. They can go a bit um, crazy, but once they've got a plan and they know what they're doing in those worlds, then it's really effective. Yeah. I wish I had something like that when I was at school. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> yeah. Got, you've already <laughs> so do I. I would have loved it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, you've already touched on, it, touched on it there, um, saying about how it's different to traditional learning. Um You've you know already spoken about the AI and the project-based learning, but is there anything in particular or key that you personally are doing to help engage students? Yeah, I think it's it's that whole thing of like connecting with students. I feel like the best teachers are the ones that they know their students. You know, they know well that person's into motorbikes or that person's crazy about this or whatever, and and then you can kind of go well you dig a little bit deeper and go, all right, that person's interested in Pokemon, then, you know, let's try and connect maths with Pokemon and let's try and do those kind of things. I feel like if you're starting to just listen to the students and let them speak, like with true student voice, then nothing can change that. And that engages everyone. I know that for, for a fact. I've, I've taught 500 kids in a school and had every student engage because I've listened to them and said, well, what do you want to do? Let's make a project around what you want to do. Well, I don't want to do anything but motorbikes. It's like, all right, cool. Here's a motorbike world. Let's go, yes. you know? And it's like, oh, okay. You know, and it's like, how couldn't anyone that's not, like everyone's got a passion or everyone's interested in different things. If you can then meet the kids and go, well, all right, we're not going to do a thing about geography and, and get those old books and look at the pictures and go, I wonder what the, you know, that land is made of or something. If we can then create the project around the students' interests, not just their external motivations, but their internal motivations. They might love working with groups. They might love working on their own. They might love just meeting with their group once a week. They might, so you're sort of like, the way that you can interact with what the, the way the student wants to learn, they can still build other capabilities, but they're gonna be engaged. If, if they're interested in motorbikes and they're obsessed, that's all they do on the weekends, in the evenings, whatever, they're always talking about it, they're reading motorbike mags, then why not make the work around what they're interested in? If they're interested in writing a persuasive essay, well, try and persuade your dad or someone about, you know, getting a new motorbike or something like that. Then if you then start to see the student like that, you're shifting the way that you look at learning and say, no, you have to learn this. Well, wh why do they have to learn it? You know, we don't know what the future's going to be. We always say, you have to learn this. This is important. You have to learn yeah. trigonometry. You have to learn algebra. You have to, 
there's all re good reasons why we learn things, but we're constantly not giving the student that choice. We obviously can't say do what you want because they're gonna it's gonna be chaos, but you can structure that enough and give people their intrinsic motivation. And then students were gonna like, they're gonna see, wow, this teacher cares about me or this school cares about me. I'm obsessed with motorbikes. And now we've got this whole metaverse world. The teacher said, I can just work on this for the next three weeks, go in the world, explore it, make my motorbike journey. No one said no to me. No one said, no, you have to do your work. People have said, oh, this motorbike thing is great. We want you to learn. We want you to go to school. Then let's make a project around it. I don't see like any way of, of that not being inspiring for any student. And, you know, sometimes you do with learning plans, you have to go a little bit away. You have to be like, well, we have to make a few extra allowances and, and then that student's in a better situation. They enjoy school and their learning progresses, you know, because you're, you're giving them that time to go, well, what do you want to learn? What do you want to learn about? What are you so passionate about? And if their kids are really passionate about something, Let's do a project on it. Let's see what we can learn in that project and then see what comes out of that. And then in the motorbike one, you might be like, well, wow, look at this. We can learn about volume. We can learn about this. We can learn about that and start to shape that around. And then that's where you're having the student as someone co-creating what they're learning because they're starting to go, well, yeah, cool. We could do the history of motorbikes. We could do, you know, okay, we might not be able to do the history of motorbikes in um, ancient Egypt, but we might learn how they got around then. And what did people do for fun back then? Did they ride camels around? Did they, you know, who knows? But like, do you know what I mean? Like you're changing that interaction yeah. and then that gives people like the problem is with traditional learning is it doesn't look at the student ever. It looks at the content. This is what we need to teach. This is what the kids have liked before or something. It looks so general. But if you just start to twist that around a bit, you will have engagement for sure. Yeah, definitely. It seems like a really great, great way to get an individual child to understand how they learn best yep. in order to retain information and enjoy it um, and engage with it rather than just otherwise it is very much the traditional get a book out and read it some people just don't learn that way you know so no. it's no, finding it's, what works for that indivi individual student yeah yeah I think and teachers are really good at that you know like I feel like in some ways that we feel we probably try and do too much, you know, when it's just in a lot of ways, it's like just get to know your students, find out what they want to do. If they want, yeah. want to go out and play football once a week, then go and play football with them once a week. You know, that's what I used to do in my classes. I'd always say to them, you know, you get one session for free every week, but you got to earn it, you know, and then they do their work, they get everything done and they have their one session to do whatever. We really got to start shifting and and listening to the students, you know, I, f I feel like that's a, a great thing to do. Yeah, definitely. And what is it about the projects that you work on that you enjoy the most? Um, I, I like for me, I, I've been lucky, I feel when I was in grade five. I mean, I never fit into the school world. I was always really different and could pick things up and was just destructive really because I just didn't know what to do. I got in when I was in grade five to a, like a gifted program and they had project-based learning. We had to design a future school and that was like our big project. And I remember that just me being involved in that just changed the way that I think of learning and school and education and everything and, and you know, gave me a lot of passion and hope. I feel that in projects that I work on, I'm, I'm still following that path to give kids that opportunity, you know, that maybe they want to go and get out of school for a day and learn how to design a future school. You know, they don't want to do maths. They don't want to be just forced and told they have to spend 30 minutes remembering the three times tables or something like that. You know, maybe they want to do other things. And so with me, I find that it's hard work. It's really, really hard work. Project-based learning is seen as innovative and progressive and just easily labeled as something that's just too difficult. But, you know, I feel that because of AI and because of this shift that's starting to happen, it motivates me a lot because I just see these worlds of the metaverse. I see these things that's going on with iCamp. I see these other projects that I do with like Pace AI and Dyslexic AI. And I just see this like we're opening up chances for people to to see learning as practical and interesting and so for me it drives me to to constantly want that 
immersive, innovative environment, you know, that's personalized for students, but it's more so it's just fun. Like, let's just start, go back to the basics a little and just work out what we, what we really need to teach people. That's why AI literacy is so interesting because it's much more than technology and it does make us change the way we think about learning. So yeah. I just like it. I like what I do. Yeah. I work a lot. I never sleep. Um, but I, I love it, you know, like that's the drive. It's a great time for an educator. And I think your innovation can give you an entirely new career now. And we've never had that as educators before where we're in a cool time to connect the world and, and make learning a bit more interesting and help the worlds of education systems that are just falling over. Yeah, that's really lovely to hear how much you love your job and what you do. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Um, you were recently previewing a new Teach AI policy resource. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Sure. I've wrote this down because I just want to get <laughs> these kind of things mm -hmm. right. Um, all right, there we go. Cool. So, yes, um, I just wanted to say the name is right of the people, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> no so worries. it's led by Pat Young Pradit. I think that's how you say his name. He's in charge. He's the academic director of Code.org. He's a very cool guy. Um, and what I really like about this Teach AI is that it, it's it's a whole range of different uh, policy ideas. So foundational policy ideas. It's designed to help educational leaders to understand AI's implication and create policies fake, uh, focused on teaching and learning. The steering committee is Code.org, ETS, ISTE, and Khan Academy. So it brings a lot of credibility. Um, what I really like is that there's a humanistic approach to it rather than just this cold kind of rules that seem unattainable. I feel that so many people are together in trying to understand how AI is going to work, you know, in every subject and, you know, right from the bottom level all the way to the top. And, and we need to be together from the superintendents to the to the teacher. The, um, and that's what I like about it. It's It's a way of just connecting great educators and great leaders and 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 have that kind of similar way you know that how are we going to implement ai and what's this going to do for learning um the world economic forum just recently came out with basically saying that problem-based learning and the project-based learning is going to be the way that ai is going to be integrated so i feel like what's so interesting about this is that we're working together we're finding approaches to kind of go well maybe we do need to go back a little bit we don't need to just put this onto the technology teacher and we really got to stay away from that because that's there's so much benefit in ai in every subject that if we put it all onto the tech teacher to go well now you're teaching ai and you can worry about it and everyone can just go about their day if we have a whole school approach if we're using these um, great, uh, you know, foundations and businesses and committees and whoever these people are made up of that that help contribute to these kind of policies are the force behind it. And they're making sure that, you know, we have to go with policy. We have to make sure we're doing this right. We can't just go, everyone use chat GPT, good luck, because there's a lot of damage that can be caused with that. So we've got to be careful. We've got to move slowly, but also together with these kind of humanistic approaches, we can actually change a lot of things in education, kind of go back to the basics a little and say, well, you know, how does this benefit the students? How do, do we do we start to invest into ways of student centered education and those kind of questions that can happen just from the AI literacy is great. Um, they do have webinars on May the 15th. So if this uh, podcast, whatever's out before then, feel free to to go on to Teach AI. I'm going to go um, to those webinars as well and be part of it. Um, but I really think that, yeah, like get on, get involved, follow Pat, follow these kind of people that are talking about AI and even the superintendents, you know, everyone's on board and just find out what's happening. Um, and so AI can can be part of your school and also not a daunting thing, not just like, oh my goodness, what does this mean? Do we have to have robots talking to, you know, um, the parents in the future? No, we can we can start by just following some of these basic examples, creating some of these guideline documents and starting somewhere. It gives you that somewhere to start from. Um, and I really think it's going to develop into something interesting. 
Yeah, it certainly sounds it. Yeah. Um, so what would you recommend to leaders in education who'd like to implement project-based learning in the classroom? Because that's something you have so much experience with. Yeah, I think there's a bigger, I, I thought about that question that you said, um, and I thought there's something bigger than project-based learning at the moment, and it's AI literacy. I feel like let's look at AI literacy as an integration, and then how can AI be integrated best and then look at problem-based learning and project-based learning. I feel that there's so much complexity with project-based learning that you'll see it. You'll see the way that I've done webinars, I've talked to many educators, and a lot of people are confused before it even begins. So I feel like the best way is to go, well, let's just start really small. Let's have a small project per term, but try to make it community involved. Try to do, you know, a, for example, at Caligio Ikigai, they had a dinosaur one. They invited the parents or the kids dressed up as dinosaurs and they had little mm. dinosaur eggs and riddles and like all that <laughs> stuff. That's as simple as it was. It was one little project. The kids wake yeah. up one day, there's dinosaurs ro roaming the world and what do we do? And that became their project, but they invited the parents along and the parents then started to like be involved in the project and go, well, this is a really interesting way of learning. The other kids did an Olympic sport as well um, at the same school, the higher um, elementary kids, and they invited their parents and they were teaching them all these Olympic sports that they made for the alien planets. So what was best about it wasn't the project so much. Some of them were messy. Some of them were better than others. You know, some people work better in groups, Some all those kind of things that happen. But the best thing that happens is it's a way to bring the parents in and go, have a look at this project. We started with this idea that all the kids woke up and there's dinosaurs roaming the streets. Now we learnt about ecosystems. Now we learnt about history. Now we learnt about food and safety and shelter. And we learnt about sustainability because we could work out how to have a city in, you know, connecting with the animals and how can we feed them and how do we share things and social emotional and and that's the thing it was a really simple project but the kids had a lot of fun with it that's a that's the main thing make sure it's simple and not complicated you want people to have fun but you really want the parents to come in and go this is what it does it opens up 10 different subjects from one project you know that the olympics one got into science and got into maths and 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 this is what it does and this is what it um can do and all the kids were engaged and the parents see that they know the kids are coming home they don't stop talking about the alien project or the dinosaur project oh my goodness there's dinosaurs and we woke up and they got to visit a metaverse world and and experience what dinosaurs are like that's what like you want to have something really good to bring in the community, not overcomplicated. Um, think about something that's current that kids like, like the Olympics or dinosaurs or something like that, out of space, whatever you want, sports. But then how can you showcase that event? Um, and then that becomes the the motivation for the kids. They got to get all their work done, their project. They might build a diorama, whatever it's going to be, but they're trying to show their parents as the as the showcase event they're not trying to prove that to the teacher and go i want to mark they're trying to teach their parents and teach the community about what they're learning and that's what i feel that if you can get a good project then connect with the community is the number one thing right. yep. well, on the flip side to that what are the some of the challenges you think leaders in education are facing right now um a lot <laughs> i think there's always been a lot on any yeah. leader anyway and then now there's AI it's got to have a whole nother level of complication um I think the biggest thing is trying to work out well number one biggest challenge in the world in my opinion is the teacher shortages and the low pay for teachers and um mm. you know how can you how can you face that challenge without having more money how can you train teachers about AI literacy without more money so money's money's a huge challenge how do you budget for these things do you then yeah. stop your numeracy budget for low numeracy rates to try and then have fancy ai tools and and whatever else it's 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 a it's a minefield but i feel that education's evolving 
I the leaders that I connect with are often seen as progressive and innovative, but they're as scared as anyone, you know. And sometimes I think it can be very easy to to label off people that are trying to do change as progressive. And I feel that everyone's going to need to be progressive with AI. I feel that the number one thing, to, like to to do is to really listen, go on LinkedIn, find out what people are talking about, you know, and it, what I see with AI and project-based learning and, and, you know, having a class, and I've seen it in my own class, to just create a better work environment for teachers that they can, they can be more creative. They can do fun AI projects. They might have these crazy ideas to do these AI projects. Listen to your staff and your staff are going to build that AI literacy knowledge at the school. Um, but yeah, I feel like the, the challenge with pay and those kind of things are, are something that we, as a society, we need to talk about because teachers need to really start getting paid more money or you're going to lose all the good teachers and they're going to go into AI development and they're going to go into, you know, other fields. Why would you want to do a highly stressful job and get paid this small amount of money when you can just shift over and become an AI developer or get into some of these other worlds and get paid a significantly more amount of money with less cognitive and still have an impact. I feel that they've got to be really careful about losing their great innovative tech teachers. I know so many that are just amazing teachers and they're thinking about being consultants and thinking about doing this AI thing. We've mm-hmm. really got to connect with those teachers and find out ways that you can either keep them or give them ways to be more creative and enjoy their job somehow. I don't know. It's a it's a very big challenge. I I try yeah. to support leaders as much as I can by just providing this idea, but, but I know that everything is going to be complex and maybe, you know, AI ultimately will help a lot. It's just going to be hard to get that integrated. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the key thing, isn't it? Like you say, the money and the pay really does underpin everything because yeah. some schools just don't have the the access to all of these things that will allow them this integration and development. So it's a lot of money too, you know, it it really is. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if I was, you know, working with one school, you know, there's at least 50 hours work that I'm going to have to do and meetings and things like that. So you start to add money onto that and multiple staff and, you know, it starts to get, it starts to get expensive. So yeah, maybe it's, it's a real, what I'm learning a lot is that now schools are starting to become closer network together. So they're creating like stronger networks of schools. And then that way, instead right. of one school having to do all of this, that school might do science, AI, this school might do tech, AI, you know, and so then together they're covering it. So to yeah. me, like that kind budget. of approach. Yeah. And like schools are going to even have to, start looking at their competitors and and those kind of schools that are normally like they don't want to work with maybe now they have to because there's no other way to do it there's no other way if if that school over there has got a budget of a hundred thousand dollars for ai and you've got no budget or such a smaller budget how are you going to make sure that you learn you know and how how is it going to be equal that's that's going to be the hardest challenge you know are the public students going to miss out because some of these other schools have more money to do that training and even basic training is it's expensive so yeah it's it's a really hard it's a it's the biggest challenge i mean i i don't know if i'd want to go back to teaching you know unless i had i've got so much creative control with what i'm doing it's stressful it's hard it's a lot of work but i feel like i'm doing something i want to do it i'm not getting shut down all the time you know yeah that if i i would go back to a school if they were like hey phil go for it do this do that do this you know but would they do that? I don't know. They might be like, no, we need to teach the kids about PowerPoint. You know, what are you doing this AI stuff? So it's like you need those kind of leaders to upskill and be a little bit more aware of of AI and, and what it's going to do. But yeah, it's it's a significant challenge. And I think that it'll only happen with teachers having more freedom, you know, and feeling yeah. a little less like I always feel like teaching is stacks on stacks. You're just carrying a book at the start of the year. And then by the end, you've got so many books and I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to go to that parent. I got to, and you're constantly just being swayed to wherever you, you kind of go, but you want to have less of that. You know, you want yeah. kind of 
less of that. So I don't know how, how that's going to work, but it's going to take a lot of money and investment and freedom for teachers, yeah. What's one piece of advice you would give to young students, perhaps if they're unsure of their future career? They don't know what they're going to do at all. Yeah, um, I would say it's it's a whole new world, really. Um, it's exciting. It's it's daunting. You know, we don't really know what's going to happen. I don't think it's going to quite be robots taking over and driving us around no. just yet for a while. Unfortunately, I, I'd love that. Um, but I feel like just try and think about, you know, what are good skills to have and good skills to have are communicating with people, learning to solve difficult problems, you know, learning to work with challenging people, not just kind of going, I don't want to work with that person. They got, you know, in life, you're going to be working with all sorts of personalities. Um, we're also at a time where we can be entrepreneurs. You know, we do have so many tools and so many ways of being an entrepreneur and start to think about how you can, you know, I, my project that I'm doing is my passion project. I love it. I love immersive learning. I love learning in projects. I love talking about the future and space and, and, and I've created my career around what I like. I do these podcasts. I could do them in my sleep. I, I love it because mm -hmm. this is what I'm passionate about. You know, I'm not yeah. like, I've got this meaning, I've got this stuff to do, you know, I love it. I love what I do. I love to learn. It takes me a long time, but that little bit of, I've always said to myself, if I do an extra 20 hours a week of self-study, then that adds up over time. And that's kind of been my thing when I've started studying and working 10 years ago, I just added that extra 20 hours a week. And now it puts me ahead with a lot of different knowledge and and skills and things like that. So just think about, you know, putting that little bit extra in to create something different and then kind of go with it. If you've got an idea, there's a girl that I'm working with, a, a student in uh, Kazakhstan, she's going to be presenting at the World Economic Forum and she's got a project to kind of re like talk about more about sustainable development goals, talk about how teachers can do these projects with kids and change and try and have real life science projects. That's her idea. That's her passion. She wants to do that. She loves it. She's really passionate about sustainability. So with that idea, she can then develop that into her own, really her own company or her own project or initiative or startup or something like that. And that's where I think that's where things are going to go. You may not have that same go to university get a job outside and so many people go to university now and don't even get a job but start to consider what are you really passionate about what makes you you know what will you do those extra 10 or 20 hours a week for what will you actually do you know what I mean and and how will you I guess how will you sorry I mucked that up I just heard a phone ringing I thought it was my my wife's phone and I thought uh oh she's left it here can I start that again sorry yeah I heard of course, the no phone ringing in the background and I was like <laughs> oh no she's left her phone because I meant to pick her up sorry that's oh no worries I think it was the neighbor's phone but it had the same ringtone and I was like <laughs> oh no she might be calling me. oh god <laughs> yeah and in Mexico you can't just have people just walking around the streets and you know it's it's oh like, if you need to go just no 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 it's okay people. it's okay she won't be back now she finished now so it's okay it was the neighbor's phone so it's okay I was just uh -huh. hearing it going oh no um mm. sorry can I start again with that question yeah, course, the student sure. question sure yeah should I just ask, this, uh, ask the question again yeah sure thanks so what's one piece of advice that you would give to young students perhaps if they're but unsure of their future career Sure. Um, I feel like the best advice that, that I would give, which I gave to um, another student who's a 15 year old student in Kazakhstan, is to really consider what your passion is, what's driving you, you know, what what do you love? Like what's what's challenging, but what do you love? Don't just do something that you love. I mean, I love watching TV and swimming in the pool mm -hmm. and and, you know, going on the boat and stuff, but that's great. But it may not get me to where I want to get to. It's fun for a while. But what I love is learning. What I love is teaching people about the metaverse and projects and, and this new way of changing education. And 
I love to challenge things. I love complicated things. I love to like break things down. I I think about all the things that I love and it's almost like I have a hundred things that I want. And then I try and create my goals and my projects and my um, initiatives around the things that I love. That way when it gets tough and when it gets hard and it's late at night or you're reading and, and it's like this is getting too much, you're going to have that extra passion to kind of keep you going. Um, we're in a great time, I believe, with AI that you can go in so many different directions. You can think of ideas. Education is going to be a huge world of change. I feel that I would love every young person to consider being an educator, but it is, it's tough. You know, the, the world educators don't get paid a lot of money and, and, you know, and there's a lot of challenges, but I hope that with AI, it's going to create a better environment for teaching, a better environment for schools. It's going to have all sorts of different opportunities, but really find something that you're, you're interested and find something that, you know, you can have that, feeling that you're making that little bit of a difference you're enjoying your life you know you're 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 connecting to your passion even if everyone thinks it's crazy I mean everyone thinks I'm crazy I'm doing projects <laughs> I'm doing innovative learning you know my parents and my family and my friends are just kind of like you just doing it you know like it's I've had I've had hundreds of people think that I'm crazy that I should never leave teaching to get to where I've got to and now look at me I'm doing all sorts of interesting things and it's only just beginning. I yeah. I really I had to take a bold step and just kind of not listen to what people are saying and just go, well, this is what I want to do. I want to I want to create this new environment of sustainability and the world and education where everyone's like, you're crazy, no one's gonna do that. You know, it's not worth it. Just do this career. It's more money and things like that. I like doing this. I like the challenge. I'm passionate. So find something that that drives you and even if people think that you're crazy and your parents don't agree with it at first, I'm sure that they will because you'll you'll keep going and they'll be like, wow, like with me, they people kind of even some of my biggest critics that have been like, you're crazy for your ideas and literally sat me down to say, Phil, you what you're doing is crazy. And now they've become my best supporters because they've been like, I was just trying to warn you. I didn't want you to go into this world and and fail, you know, but in the yeah. end they see and they go well wow look at all these cool things you're doing and now I'm helping those same people that that doubted me at the start you know and that's what I find the most interesting is that if you're passionate about something you want to get something happening the world of AI now you probably can you can I'm I'm often a one person show doing all what I do and writing emails and connecting all these things and I've got AI some like as my sidekick sometime about helping me do all these little things and you know, follow, it's that, it's really like, it sounds very soppy, follow your heart and follow your dreams and things like that, but do it. Like, why not? Because it's going to be tough. If you find something that's, that, that's at need in the world and it's not there yet, then maybe just get that happening. You know, that's how things have happened before and, you know, connect well, have a good support network, have good friends, don't take life too seriously and you'll find something, you know, you'll find something that you love and you'll find something you enjoy and you might like me sometimes I get emails from people and say wow you've inspired me to do this and now this is happening in the class or the school or something like that and it's a great feeling because I know that came from my own decision to go you know what I'm going to go out on my own I'm not going to follow the normal path and I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to create this life and it's worth it it's really worth it it's tough but it's worth it and and we have now such a uh, an ability to be creators and um, entrepreneurs and you know we're seeing like so many young kids now that are making millions from TikTok and everywhere else that they're just like why not why why can't you do that now you know follow follow that dream and do it well yeah yeah great advice it really is trust your gut I mean you know yourself best and you trust yourself so I think it's a very true point of you know people might be a bit unsure and a bit like oh god what are you doing to begin with but when you prove like, no, look, I know myself, you know, it's, I'm going to find my way with it. They will come to understand and be on board with you. Um, but just, yeah, it's it's keeping that trust in yourself, isn't it, to push through? Yeah. And most people, like, I think we we overcomplicate everything in life. Most people are just yeah. kind of winging it, you know, like these yeah, AI sure. people and everyone, you just kind of often just picking it up as you go. And how many jobs do you do mm -hmm. that? You just, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm working it out and, suddenly you you can do it well so it really is yeah. follow 
follow your instincts in that way yeah yeah well, I think that's a lovely note to end on with some great advice. So thank you so much for your time today, Phil. It's been really great chatting to with you. And cool, thank you. We're really excited to see the rest of your work for the rest of this year and into 2025. We hope we'll get you at one of the guest events at some point and we'll be chatting again in the future. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very no much. Worries. Enjoyed it. Soon. Thanks for joining this week's guest cast. Make sure you visit our website, guesteducation.com, the essential resource for educators to subscribe to the podcast and to enjoy the latest education news.